Frank Sinatra, transcribed as Rocky Fortune. Hi. I don't know about you, but I'm the kind of guy who can't stay put. I get restless. Give me a nice soft job, a buck in my pocket and a meal ticket, and one will get you ten, I'll quit the job, lose the buck on the GGs, and exchange the meal ticket for a train ticket. You take last week, for instance. The employment agency sends me down to Houston Street for a job as a chauffeur. Hey, Mac. This 159 Houston. And hey, what do you want? Somebody wants to hire a chauffeur. A chauffeur? <laughs> I made a joke. You take a look around this neighborhood, mister. Who you think got money for a chauffeur? Not even for food, he got money. Look, all I know is the agency got a call for a chauffeur. Five foot nine, thin, chauffeur's license, must be able to wear a pre-cut uniform. And you get the wrong blade. 159 Houston, sixth floor. This is 159 Houston. My name is Zaconic. I'm the janitor. You take a look how many floors we got, eh? Maybe they meant fifth floor. I better go up. Yeah, go ahead. Let me know if you get the job, eh? <laughs> <laughs> This don't look like chauffeur land to me, but I figure I already blew a subway token to get here, so I leg it up four flights of stairs left over from a Charles Adams cartoon. As I am rounding the turn at flight number five, a funny-looking little guy steps out of the shadows. Hey, buddy. Yeah? Uh, you got change for a buck. Sure. Here. Thanks. Hey. Huh? Where's the clam? Here. Oh. I've been rolled before, but this guy works on my skull like he's a Sherman tank in the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. When I come to, I'm in a white room with iron grill work in the windows. It's morning, which means I made an evening of it. Alongside my bed stands a gorilla in a white coat. I figure this place for a pad at Bellevue. I am mistaken. Okay, take it easy, Steve. Oh. How do you feel this morning? Oof. You've had a couple of bad nights, Steve. A couple? What day is this? Tuesday. Holy smokes. I've been out since Saturday. Last week, you were pretty good. Only a couple of lapses. Did you say last week? That's right, Steve. The name is Rocky. Rocky Fortune. You're not going to start that again, are you, Steve? Start what? That Rocky Fortune bit. Dr. Harris wouldn't like it. Listen. Oh, what a hangover. Take it easy. Look, where am I, Buster? Mount Kenzie Rest Home. Mount Kenzie. Is that in the Bronx? It's near Denver. Denver? Denver, New York? Denver, Colorado. Okay, buddy. If the joke's over, I'll take my clothes and get out of here. Joke, Steve? Joke, Jake. Give me the clothes. I'm afraid I can't do that. Not without Dr. Harris's order. Will you tell the good doctor that Rocky Fortune wants to have a word with him? Now, if you're going to insist on that, Steve... I'm afraid we'll have to try the treatment again. What treatment? Come along. Take the hands off, Buster. You're etching the epidermis. You coming along? Not if I can help it. Okay. Johan's a big guy in the judo department, besides which they got me drugged like a hypochondriac with a third-degree hangnail. He drags me into a white tire room and starts to massage my head with a fist like a sledgehammer. Only this bum's got a new ring. First he puts a pail on my head and then he hits the pail. After 20 minutes of this, I begin to feel like the main bell on St. Mary's at Christmas morning. Just when I think I can't take it anymore, a gray-haired guy with a scarred face ambles in. All right, Johan, all right. That's enough. Take the pail off his head. Oh. How do you feel, Stephen? Oh, just dandy. Johan is so impulsive. Repulsive. Would you like a cigarette? Yeah. How about get me out of this polo coat? Yes, in a moment. First, I want to see if you've come to your senses. Look, would you mind telling me what this is all about? One minute I'm being rolled in a hallway in New York City, and the next minute I wake up in Denver, Colorado. Stephen, you've been here at Mount Kenzie for eight years. My name is Rocky, born Rocco Fortunato. Your name is Stephen Crandall III. Eight years ago, you were thrown from a polo pony and sustained a head injury. You suffered from delusions. You've been under treatment here. Come on, Doc. What's the ransom? Ransom? 
How much do I have to raise to get out of here? You see, Johan, he's still very sick. Poor fella. Yes. I'm afraid we'll just have to continue the treatment. All right, Johan, put the pail on his head. Now, once again, what's your name? Rocky. And if you don't like it, you can... All right, Johan. Now we'll try it once more. Your name? Go jumping. Johan. Name? That's enough, Johan. Very well, young man, your name? Stephen. Stephen what, please? Stephen Crandall, the third. Your age? Thirty-two. How long have you been here? Eight years. Why did you come here? Polo accident. Good, good. And now, once again, your name? Crandall. Stephen Crandall. By the time Johan and the phony doctor decided to call it a night, they almost had me convinced I was Stephen Crandall. Pardon me, the third. They doped me up again for the night, and next morning we cover the course again. Good morning, Stephen. Uh, you slept well? I had a funny dream. So? I dreamed I was a guy named Rocky Fortune. I dreamed I went to apply for a job as a chauffeur in New York City, and somebody sapped me. Pretty funny, huh? Uh, but you understand it was only a dream. Oh, sure. I'm happy to hear that. You see, today we have a surprise for you. Can you guess? I get a new pail. No jokes? No jokes. Check. What's the surprise? You're going home. I thought you said no jokes. Well, this isn't a joke, Stephen. I feel you're ready to leave at last. We're going to let you go home, on trial, of course. Now, at the first sign of your delusion that you are someone other than Stephen Crandall... I'm afraid you'll have to return. When do I fly? Tomorrow morning. Johan will accompany you. I get another shot of essence of vampire and wake up next morning feeling as strong as a mouse. Before I know what happens, they hustle me into a black Duesenberg and drive toward Denver. About two miles out of town, we cut up a winding private road and stop in front of a 28-room bungalow. The doc and Johan walk me to the door, close enough so I can feel the muzzle of Johan's 45 caressing my spine. The door is opened by a medium-sized butler right out of Dickens, with side whiskers and all. Yes, gentlemen. Hello, Deems. Why, it's Dr. Harris and Mr. Stephen. We weren't expecting you so early. Mr. Stephen, how are you? Speak up, Steve. Hmm? Oh, fine, Deems, the old man. Just peachy. Come in, sir. Come in. Welcome home. Thanks. Uh, have a seat, Mr. Stephen. I'll inform Miss Laurie you're home. I lower myself into a chunk of Chippendale and wait. My head aches and everything looks like a 3D movie without glasses. After a couple of minutes through the blur, I see a dame come floating down the staircase. Even in my weak condition, I can appreciate that she's got more curves than the Jersey Turnpike. She takes one look and comes on like gangbusters. Steve, darling... Oh, darling, darling. Sis? This is your wife, Steve. He's still a bit confused, Laura. Oh, I understand, Doctor. Oh, it's good to have you home, Steve. Kiss me again, darling. You know something, baby? It's good to be home. clinch again, and I am just beginning to enjoy my new identity when Deemsy clears his adenoids and announces... <clears throat> uh, excuse me, Miss Laura. Hmm. Uh, judge Harley is calling. The judge here? Well, Dr. Harris, is it all right? Judge Harley is an old friend of the family, isn't he? 
Oh, yes. He's known Stephen since he was a boy. Well, I think it'll be all right. Just behave yourself, Stephen. Oh, sure. Very well, Deems. Show him in. Uh, yes, ma'am. Remember, Stephen. How can I forget? Uh, this way, Your Honor. Laura. Well, 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 and Stephen. I heard you were coming home, but I didn't expect I'd actually find you here. How are you, my boy? Great, great. Just great. Uh, let me look at you. Oh, he's changed, Laura. Thin. Ought to eat more. Well, I expect eight years in a, a way it can change a man. Even eight hours can do it. Mm, very thin indeed. You know, I hate to see a thin man or a mm, woman. Uh, this is Dr. Harris from the rest home and his assistant, Mr. Fiddler. Judge Harley, gentlemen. How do you do, Judge? Uh, I, I won't intrude. I just dropped by to see how you were progressing with your uh, personal bankruptcy. My attorney will file in a week or so, Judge. Mm, yes, well, it mustn't delay too long, you know. As a friend, I'll hold back the flood as long as I can, but creditors will be creditors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'll be running along. Stephen, it's been wonderful to see you back in the bosom of your family. You fatten him up now, Laura. Hate to see a thin man or <clears throat> woman. Good day. I give the judge a couple of seconds to leg down to his black limousine, which I can see through the French window. I toss a haymaker at Johan and pull an Esther Williams through the casement. I land in a bramble patch, Natch, just as the judge gets to his car. Judge! Judge Harley! Hold it, hold it. Stephen, uh, what is it? Get in the car. I can't talk now. Come on, let's get going. Oh, but Stephen, I... Look, I'm not Stephen. My name is Rocky Fortune. This whole thing's a big hoax. Now step on it before they get here. Of course, Stephen. Rocky! Uh, strange, it won't start. The ignition's not on. Okay, hold it. Don't try to get away, Steve. Fat chance. You okay, Judge? Now, what happened? Steve here tried to do away with himself. Right out of the window. Lucky it was the first floor. What was he telling me about being Rocky something or other? Oh, he's Rocky, all right. Judge, listen. Call the Gridley Employment Agency in New York, will Steve, you? Steve, you know what I got in my pocket. Now, be a good boy and I'll give you some candy. Okay, man. You win. This time. Sorry to have troubled you, Judge. Come on, Steve. I'm glad I was of service. Take good care of Steve now. Don't worry about that, Judge. It's thin. Very thin. <laughs> me back into the house like a piece of stale mackerel, and the good doctor immediately slips me a needle full of wink and blink and a nod. Yeah, there we are. Oh, the poor darling, he's all scratched up. Let me take him up to our room. Yeah. My dear, you see how unstable he is. I'm afraid he'd better be in a separate room. Johan will stay with him. But we haven't seen each other for eight years. Yeah. I'm sorry, Laura. As his physician, You're I... no more physician than I am Steve Crandall. Baby, they're trying to put one over on you. I don't know why. Johan. But... Yes, Doctor. Johan puts the muscle on me, and I'm locked into the guest room on the second floor. By the time we reach the door, my head feels like the steam room at an all night Turkish bath. I get my ear on the pillow and pass out. Rocky. Hmm? It's me, Laura. Hmm. I've been waiting for you. I've arrived. Kiss me, Rocky. Why not? Say, that's nice perfume. I'm glad you like it. Makes me sleepy. Sleep? It smells like, like... Smells like marsh gas. Gas. Gotta, gotta wake up. Gotta open, open the window. Come on, Rocky. Come on, boy. That's a boy crawl. Crawl, boy. That's it. 
Now the ch chair. Window. Come on, boy. Steve! Steve, what is it? I was in my room and I heard a crash. Nothing much, baby. Let me get some air. Well, you're sick. I ain't healthy. Whew. Turn off that gas heater, will you? Where's Johan? He's downstairs with Dr. Harris. Well, Steve, what happened? Nothing. Your friend Johan tried to fit me for a casket, that's all. Steve! I am not Steve. Let's get it straight, honey. Whew. Before Muscles gets back. My name is Rocky Fortune. I'm a ringer. The doc and Johan are trying to pass me off as your husband. You ought to know better. I... I do. It's a nice time to say so. Well, I didn't dare. They threatened to murder me. Okay, let's have it. My husband committed suicide in their sanatorium some months ago. He carried very heavy life insurance. Naturally, we couldn't collect on a suicide. Johan and the doctor decided that they wouldn't report the death. They got you to take Steve's place. I begin to get it. I have an accident, you collect double indemnity, and they pry you loose from the money. They forced me into it. Okay, we gotta get out of here, baby. But they'll kill us. Not if they want me to look like an accident, they won't. I'm worth a lot of loot, kid. Well, how can we do it? Is there anybody in the house you can trust? Deems. Fine. Get to him, tell him to have a car ready in front of the house in exactly five minutes. Where's Johan and the doc? Downstairs. Probably giving me plenty of time to soak up the ether. Okay, look, go down, tell them I'm lying here dead. When they come up, you get out to the car. Got it? Yes. Wish me luck. Good luck, Steve. Rocky. Good luck, Rocky. Soon as Laura leaves, I fix up a dummy out of pillows and stuff it in the bed. And I slip out of the room and hide in an alcove about ten feet away. I wait. A minute later, the doc and Johan come stumbling up the stairs like a thundering herd. I let him rush into the room, take two giant steps, and lock the door behind him. Uh, open that door. Open that door. Can't hear you, Uncle. Please, please open the door. Temper, temper. Open the door. Please. So long, gentlemen. Don't think it hasn't been a pleasure because it hasn't. <laughs> I'm down the steps like a grasshopper in a granary and on my way out when I see the telephone and get a sudden inspiration. Operator. Operator, I want the municipal courthouse. Judge Harley, it's an emergency. I'll connect you with information. I said emergency, baby. If it's an emergency, baby, I'll give you the hospital. I'll settle for information. Make it fast. Upstairs, I can hear Johan and the doctor making headway with the door, and I don't have much time to waste on explanations. I need something that'll knock the judge right off his bench and bring him out here in a hurry. Hello? Judge Harley? Yes? This is Deems, the Crandall butler. Oh, what is it, Deems? Master Stevens has just murdered the entire family, sir. He's kidnapping me. What? What is this? What's that banging noise? It, uh, dynamite, sir. He's blowing up the house room by room. I think you'd better get out here, sir. Here they come. Deems. Bye. I figured this ought to bring him out on the double, so I write a message on the mirror with Laura's lipstick and leap out to the car one jump ahead of the hounds. Are you all right, Rocky? Fine. Well, what took so long? Had to call my bookmaker and was sure a bet. What about the doc and, and Johan? On the inside, looking out. Head for the local constabulary, Deems, the old sock. Yes, sir. I spend the next few minutes gazing fondly into Laura Crandall's lavender eyes as she gazes back. I can see the fine blue blood surge through her cheeks. And on her, a blue surge looks pretty good. I'm ready to surrender to the beast in me when Deemsy makes a screaming turn off the main highway and pulls to a stop ten feet from the edge of a cliff. Hey, what gives? There's been a car following you, sir. I didn't see any car. If I may say so, sir, you weren't paying much attention. All right, all right, let's get going. I'm afraid not, sir. Listen, egghead, I said let's get... You were saying? Put down the gun, Damesy. I'll give the orders, Mr. Fortune. Get out. Wait a minute, what is this? Just step over to the edge of the cliff, if you please. What if I don't please? You take on weight all of a sudden. He means it, Rocky. Okay. Mind if I ask what happens next, or am I being naive? Next, Mr. Fortune, you accidentally fall off the cliff. The car follows you. Accident. Double indemnity. Exactly. Now, turn around. 
What makes you think they're going to believe it? You're suicidal. Even Judge Harley saw you go through a window. Very neat. Turn around. We have much time. Okay, okay. Laura, push him over. I... Come on, this is no time to lose your nerve. Steve, I... Push him. I can't do it. All right. Take the gun. I'll do it myself. I hear a car. Stop worrying. All right, Mr. Fortune. That first step looks like a Lulu. Get going. Wait. Wait, listen. A police car. Come on. Okay, hold it. Hold it or I shoot. Steve! Steve, watch out for the cliff! Oh, oh. oh no. Grab her! I've got her. Let me go, let me go. Take it easy, baby. You all right, Mr. Fortune? I'll let you know later. Right now, I'm a little numb. Well, he picked up the car and then lost it again. What convinced you I was telling the truth when I called? I know you weren't Stephen Crandall the first time I laid eyes on you. I also know I couldn't do anything about it at the time. When you phoned me before you left the house a few minutes ago, I'd already checked the employment agency in New York City. You're lucky we picked up the car. What about the guy who fell off the cliff, Judge? Is he dead, Sergeant? Well, I didn't have a chance. Who is he? As far as I know, he's the Crandall Butler. You got it wrong, Judge. You know him? I think if you take off those phony side whiskers, you'll find out he's the guy I was supposed to impersonate, Steve Crandall. What? Blossom here called him Steve just before he took the Brody. Laura, is it Stephen? Yes. Why did you do this? We, we had no money when Steve left the institution. He cooked up this scheme with the doc and Johan to, to cash in on his own insurance. Next time I answer an ad for a chauffeur, remind me to make sure they want a live chauffeur, not a corpse. Tonight, NBC Radio has presented transcribed... Frank Sinatra, as that footloose and fancy-free young man known as Rocky Fortune. Others in the cast included Francis Urey, Maurice Hart, Jack Mather, Herb Ellis, Stanley Fraser, Lynn Allen, and Stephen Chase. Andrew C. Love directed. Eddie King speaking. Now to tell you about next week's adventure, here's Frank Sinatra as Rocky Fortune. So that's how come I'm back on unemployment insurance again. Not for long, though. Next week, I'll tell you about the next job I had. Stewart on a big luxury line at a Bermuda. I figured I'd like to see the ocean, you know. A couple of guys were trying to help me, too. Only they wanted me to see it the hard way. From the bottom. Next week, then, tune in again when Frank Sinatra returns as Rocky Fortune. We join American business and industry in saluting the National Safety Council and the thousands of safety-minded men and women who are, this week, attending the 41st Annual Safety Council Congress and Exposition in Chicago. With the cooperation of business and industry, the National Safety Council is making life in America safer for everyone. Enjoy Fibber McGee and Molly tonight on the NBC Radio Network.